Welcome to Nitte, a place where learning goes way beyond the classroom. For some, it's home. For some, it's a step towards transformation. For some, it's the beginning of a wonderful journey with like-minded people. Thanks to the teaching and mentoring activities and dynamic incubation center, I am now industry ready. Engineering at NITE includes aeronautical, civil, computer science, electrical and electronics, electronics and communication, information science, mechanical, biotechnology, MTech, MCA and PhD. NITE also collaborates with reputed universities around the world to give students an international academic exposure. At NITE, the focus on research has not only helped me understand my subjects, but reach for the stars. NITE offers a unique co-op program and exposure to architects, artisans and urban designers. I aspire to be the heart of progress. Chema is listed in the World Directory of Medical Schools. the art of helping people smile. A.B. Shetty Dental College is listed as one of the top dental colleges in the country. Justice K.S. Hegde Charitable Hospital, part of the Nite Group, has 1,000 beds, advanced labs and diagnostic centers which attract a good number of patients from across South India. Along with teaching and clinical practices, we offer programs in pharmacy, nursing, physiotherapy, speech and hearing, biomedical sciences, and paramedical programs like respiratory therapy technology, operation theater technology, medical imaging technology, and medical laboratory technology. I've always been curious about the chemistry of cures. I help in healing. From toddlers to seniors, I care for them all. I believe I can help improve the quality of other people's lives. We are blessed with the ability to speak and hear from birth. Not everyone is as lucky. I want to do my bit to help the less fortunate. I am proud to be able to assist a surgeon in the operation theatre. From simple x-rays to sophisticated MRI and PET scans. My course trains me to assist radiologists and physicians. The training I have received in testing blood, tissues and body fluids assures me a job at any clinical laboratory. 
I help people enjoy every breath. I believe in the power of research to change the world. Nuxer is a one of its kind teaching and research center that addresses society's health needs through painstaking research in biomedical sciences, food safety, microbiology, and biotechnology. What I learn here and at my internship in the University of Minnesota, USA, I will carry with me and teach my community to live healthy and stay happy. We believe in being our own bosses. The Bloomberg Lab helps students stay up to date with the latest trends in global markets. Students also have access to Bloomberg Analytics and can, in the course of their learning, develop their own analytics. I cook my own recipe for success. Sarosh Institute of Hotel Administration molds each student to become perfect hospitality professionals. A healthy blend of polish and panache. I speak for the voiceless. This is what I'm taught and this is what I'll practice. I design my dreams and my goals. I measure success by the trends I inspire. Bachelors in Fashion Technology at NITE offer students state-of-the-art labs and the space to get their creative juices flowing. With the best of infrastructure, an active placement cell and a lively atmosphere, education at NITE helps students grow, breathe and bloom. Hello? Oh yeah? Graduate into a better future. Graduate with Are we live? Okay, okay. So we will uh, start. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to uh, the Consortium of Rare Genetic and Bone Marrow Disorders seminar series. Today we have an interesting talk on gene therapy and its uh, implications. Uh, by an industrious uh, resource person, uh, Dr. Shiv Kumar Vishwanathan. Uh, before we get into the, the topic and before we request uh, Dr. Shiv to uh, share his knowledge on gene therapy with us, uh, we, all, we have with uh, uh, us joining in this webinar, Honorable Vice Chancellor of our university, Professor Dr. Satish Kumar Bhandari. Sir is uh, a very well-known and renowned ENT surgeon. But more important thing that I need to mention here is that he is an avid researcher. He has done some seminal work on uh, ENT related aspects and particularly uh, on his uh, surgical uh, procedures. And Sir is uh, a keen follower of research in this field. The fact that Sir has agreed to join us in this webinar in spite of being so busy in his schedule speaks a lot about his interest uh, about the updates that are happening in the field of science. Thank you very much, sir, for joining us today. Uh, I would like to request you to kindly give us a few introductory words before we start the webinar. Over to you, sir. Good afternoon. Uh, very distinguished uh, resource person, Dr. Shiv Kumar Vishwanathan and Dr. Arati and Dr. Anirban Chakrabarti from the consortium and uh, very enthusiastic participants in this very interesting seminar on gene therapy in the age of coronavirus. It is indeed my privilege to be part of this webinar conducted by Nita University Center for Science Education Research in uh, collaboration with the consortium of rare genetic and bone marrow disorders of the university. 
Uh, I am very delighted to tell you that over the last five years, NITTE has made very conscious effort in promoting research culture in the university. I am equally delighted to tell you that these efforts have resulted in a very conspicuous success as evidenced from the large number of extramural funds obtained by, by our faculty, patent publications, and scientific communications in very high impact journals. NITA University Center for Science Education Research is a state of the art research institute established by the university to carry out uh, some cutting edge research in the field of biomedicine. For the last five years, Nuxar has achieved phenomenal success and has contributed immensely in the research output of the university. The university has provided a seed grant to set up the consortium of rare genetic and bone marrow, bone marrow disorders at our university. I am pleased to know that uh, Dr. Anil Ban Chakrabarti, who has co-founded this consortium with Dr. Arati Kanna Gupta, is committed towards, uh, towards bringing out uh, meaningful and impactful outcomes from the activities of this consortium. I am told that the consortium has already embarked on a number of research projects aimed at uh, delineating the genetic spectrum of rare, uh, particularly mandibulofacial dysostosis and uh, some orthopedic syndromes in our population. Besides uh, these rare genetic conditions, the consortium also conducts webinars on topics of relevance and today they have very distinguished uh, resource person, Dr. Shiv Kumar Vishwanathan from uh, Cincinnati Children's Hospital Memorial Center, USA, who is going to share his experiences in, uh, in particularly very contemporary topic of uh, gene therapy. Uh, to my knowledge, gene therapy is a technique that uh, modifies person's genes to treat uh, or cure some several uh, by mechanisms like uh, replacing the disease causing gene or inactivating the disease causing gene or uh, introducing some new gene or modified gene into the body to treat uh, disease. Despite uh, its efficacy, uh, there are some safety concerns. I think uh, Shukumar will agree with me. As I understand, gene therapy is currently available only as a part of uh, clinical trial, according to my knowledge. The biggest concern of gene therapy is the use of, I understand they use viral vectors as delivery agents. And the safety issues related to this particular, this viral vectors, they got some undesirable outcomes of viral infections in the body. And uh, consequences of this uh, issue is where uh, is uh, always debatable. And we have to, we are concerned about that. We have to address these issues, particularly during this COVID-19 uh, uh, vaccine, which has created so much of pure or, or, or uh, debate about uh, COVID vaccine. The topic chosen is very apt, according to me. And uh, we are having a lot of issues related to, to uh, after the particular, as I said, the vaccine hesitancy regarding COVID-19 this is created, uh, as I said, really there will be a lot of uh, uh, questionnaire. There will be a lot of uh, questions asked by the participants. I, I think Shukumar uh, must be prepared for that. I am told that uh, the clinical trials in gene therapy, people have shown some success, particularly treating diseases like uh, immune deficiency, hemophilia, blindness caused by retinitis pigmentosa, and leukemia. And that's, uh, understand that there's some positive results in these conditions. I'm sure our learned resource person, Dr. Shiv Kumar, who has years of experience in clinical trials, will have some good overview on gene therapy and uh, regarding the benefits and the risks involved with it. I believe the topic is very, very relevant for particularly PhD students, research scholars, scientists, clinicians, for participating in this webinar. On behalf of the university, I extend a very warm welcome to 
our uh, distinguished resource person dr shiv kumar and uh, i congratulate kita university center for science education research and our uh, consortium of uh, rare genetic disorders for organizing this webinar and i wish all the best and i hope we'll have a very fruitful deliberation after this very interesting talk by uh, distinguished faculty dr shiv kumar vishwanath thank you very much wish you all the best thank you so much sir for your uh, introductory remarks so kind of you to have appreciated the efforts of this consortium and we believe uh, with the support of the university we'll be able to make some meaningful contributions to these uh, conditions that we are focused on uh, so uh, so it's my job now to introduce our uh, speaker for the day uh, dr shiv kumar vishwanathan uh, he has uh, a long long cv and uh, i would not like to eat up the time that he is supposed to engage us with so i will go very quickly with his cv of course dr vishwanath uh, dr shiv started his career uh, in 2000 he completed his bachelor of science from birla institute of technology in india in 2000 uh, under pediatric intensive care followed by his masters in 2002 in master of engineering in biotechnology from again from birla institute of technology uh, he then went on to do his phd in molecular and developmental biology in 2008 he completed his phd from university of cincinnati uh, from uh, dr d udro benson's lab and then in 2012 he got himself as a pmp certified project uh, manager uh, Post his uh, PhD, he joined uh, as a project leader in GLP studies at the Cincinnati Children's Hospital, followed by uh, where he worked for two years, and then he had a stint of one year at Marga Systems Private Limited as a consultant uh, in agile development, and then he came back to India, uh, joined uh, Med Genome Labs Private Limited as a research uh, principal scientist from 2014 to 2016. and then he decided to go back to the us again and uh, he uh, again went back to the lab i, I understand and uh, he got into several positions including uh, a senior research associate position at loyola university then uc medical center then again he went back to his alma mater university of cincinnati and at present he is associated with this uh, center and he is in charge of uh, this clinical trials uh, he has carried out a lot of uh, activities as uh, an eminent uh, leader his leadership roles include uh, research lead in study design protocol development and site selection project manager and study point uh, uh, person responsible for study protocol development irb approval trial registration and all study operation uh, dr shiv has several honors to his credits uh, he was bestowed the of course during his studies he got the graduate assistantship from university of cincinnati uh, uh, followed by a summer fellowship and then pre doctoral and post doctoral fellowship from american heart association and then in 2010 he got jefferson award for public service and uh, he has also received other awards from uh, american heart association genomic and precision medicine uh, for attending scientific uh, conferences and uh, sessions he has several publications to his credit uh, uh, i would not like to go into details of all of them uh, just to mention a few he has got uh, several publications in reputed journals including jama plus one cytotherapy uh, frontiers in physiology for, uh, european journal of pharmacology journal of molecular cell and cardiology and journal of uh, heart valve diseases uh he is a member of several uh, organizations uh, to name a few american heart association uh, a project management institute member sigma sai uh, scientific research honor society and then a uh, member of indian association of physician assistants so with this uh, i would like to now request dr shiv to take us through his uh, talk today on gene therapy and uh, to give us a uh, uh, overview on his work particularly on the sickle cell disease that he is going to talk us about over to you dr shiv 
Thank you, Anirban, for such a elementary uh, introduction, and I'm so honored to have Dr. Bandari give the introductory speech. It's, it's such a such an honor. Uh, I'm hoping that I will live up to all that that uh, they have said about me. So uh, let's let's walk through without much ado. Um, so most of my work has been with uh, um, on gene therapy and. <clears throat> Though I did start my career as a um, physician assistant, and it is the the physician assistantship and the, the quest for knowledge has basically taken me all over the place. So it is my um, advice, or and I'm starting off with an advice for all graduate students: is that find your passion. Once you find your passion, the passion will drive you wherever you need to go and you don't have to worry about anything, okay? So, um, I just want to make sure, like, is my slide now visible? Yes, Shiv, it is visible. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. So, the title of my talk is Gene Therapy in the Age of Coronavirus. I'm, talking, I'm going to talk about the GLP safety and clinical trials. And it's particularly reason that I put this on is that because as uh, Dr. Bandari pointed out that pretty much most of gene therapy work that's being done is based on a viral vector. And particularly the one that I'm going to talk about is using a type of virus called lentivirus, which falls within the same category as coronavirus, which has basically an envelope and has all those specific proteins on top of it that makes it specifically go to one tissue over the other. So. It's one of the things that would basically, um, the moment people say like another virus, then people just sit up and then now like they're like, all their guards are up and they don't want to listen any further, basically. So anyway, let's walk through this. So I'm going to talk about what is sickle cell anemia? Um, why does it happen? How can we cure this? And how, do, how does gene therapy play into this? And then designing the cure and getting through the process of the efficacy and safety of gene therapy. And then talking about what is the current status. Again, Dr. Bandari excellently put it that safety has been in the past like a big concern and that we need to address it um, effectively when we, when we design these. So what is sickle cell disease? Sickle cell disease is a single amino acid change that causes the disease. Uh, this amino acid change is in the beta globin, which is the, um, the predominant biggest protein that's basically carrying all the uh, iron in the red cells. And that's what um, basically holds the iron so that it can um, carry the oxygen. Now, what happens is there is this single glutamine six that just converts to a valine six. Now, what happens because of that? These um, beta globins, they now have to couple with the alpha globin and then form this uh, tetrametic chain, uh, um, molecule. And within the tetrametic molecule, they can actually have the ion in the middle. Do, um, can you guys see my pointer? Let me make sure that's on it. Can you see my pointer? Anybody can see my pointer? Yeah, it's moving. Pardon. Okay, okay. So the ion is basically sitting right in the middle, and then we need this alpha beta um, uh, multimer to basically hold it in place. Now, because this glutamine to valine change, these uh, um, polymer, like multimers, cannot interact with each other. And when they interact with each other, instead of making a nice planar surface, they start making long chains. And when it starts making long chains, you can imagine having like a big stick inside a tent. It basically stretches it out. And then instead of having a nice little, uh, like a varas shaped uh, red blood cell, now you have a sickle shaped red blood cell, okay? And that is basically the primary cause for all the uh, problems that they will face uh, throughout the life. Now, sickle cell disease is something that started off in the tropics as a response to getting malaria infection. Uh, how are these two connected? When people have sickle cell disease, the malarial parasite cannot enter the red cell. It, it, and it becomes um, what do you call it, unconducive for it to develop inside the red cell. So 
they cannot live in it. So people who have sickle cell disease don't get malaria because malaria is the largest killer in the world. It basically gives them immunity insurance against malaria. But the, the problem with that is as long as people are in the totally tropical zone with high oxygen content and not much of a, uh, this thing, they will be fine. But if they contract some other disease, some other infection, or they move to like northern latitudes where they can have lower oxygen content um, and becomes colder, uh, then their blood cells don't want to uh, work the same way as it should normally work. And so these sickle cells then get entangled and then they cause blood clots all over the body. So children who are born with sickle cell disease, they are in constant pain because it's just, imagine having like a heart attack throughout your body in every tissue, including the brain and kidney and everything. So they tend to have increased incidence of uh, memory loss and other things because it's affecting their brain um, and they're constantly in pain. And then so their kidney fails, the liver fails, a whole bunch of things happen. So this is data from the US, a um, few years older, but that still holds fine. fine. Uh, about 240, thousand children are born annually and about 80 percent of them will die within the second birthday why is second birthday important because when they are babies in their mother's uh, belly they express a different type of globin called as an f globin this f globin is can bind with the alpha just like the beta does but it has certain properties that will prevent it from making into these rods. So they, those that express f globin cannot become sickle shape. And by the time they get to second birthday, then the f globin expression goes away and they are expected to like fend for themselves from now on and then beta globin comes in, which is basically a mutant globin and that's when they start seeing things go south. So in the US alone, there's 80,000 plus affected and um, that basically is one in 400. It primarily affects African Americans, but also affects uh, Hispanic Hispanic uh, money. Like they are in from uh, Mexico and um, uh, Northern uh, Latin America. So, because of the uh, the, the treatment modalities that is available, 97 percent of the children will survive to the age of 18. But from then on. The quality of the life is basically terrible because every year that passes, more of their tissue is dying. And by the time they are 40, significant portions of their body is dead because of the affected repetitive um, clotting and then subsequently causing ischemia and injury for them. Now, in India, it is slightly different because Nationally, sickle cell disease is about 11 to 17 percent. But this is trying to say something like a, a taking everybody into account. But if you look at it very closely, sickle cell disease affects a lot of people in tribal belts, especially like Madhya Pradesh, um, parts of Urusa, uh, and then um, Chhattisgarh, like, uh, and then also happens in um, southern Karnataka, northern Tamil Nadu, like in the in the hills, like in the uh, Nilgiri hills, those places it happens very common. So it's, and if you look at it, because they are tribal in origin, they are socially impoverished, they cannot afford a lot of care, but for them it affects close to like 11 to 40 percent. Uh, so 25% of the population gets 40% of the disease and the rest of the 75% barely even sees it. So that's where it's a big difference comes between what we see in the US and what we see in, in India. The other problem is that our way of trying to calculate how many people have it is also a little bit of a problem because Indians, we tend to live very endemically. We don't travel very far within the country but, but stay very locally, especially true for tribal uh, population. So unless a particular population is actually accessed and sampled, we will never know whether they actually have it or not. So that becomes a big problem. The third thing is the, the phenotype that we see among um, Indians tends to be a little bit more milder. It's not as severe as what we see with African-Americans. So the number of 
times that it gets reported or they get bring the child or an adult to the clinic is also less frequent so you may not be able to count them exactly unless you go into the into the field okay so what is the parent method that's usually followed this is of course again from the us it's not uh, indian methods um, so it's usually genetic counseling they manage the individual systems if they have muscle pain then they give them pain relief then they have uh, skin conditions chronic ulcers they also get uh, acute conditions then they usually have to remove some of the uh, blood from their body because it's now so jam packed with so much dead cells okay. Uh, and then as the age progresses, then you have to take care of the neurological conditions, you have to take care of the renal condition and cardiac conditions as things progress. Now, what can be done to prevent it? So we, as I already said, there is another form of globin that's called as the F globin or fetal globin that has small changes in them that is different from the beta globin and that because of those changes, even if there is a sickle beta that is sitting there, it will prevent it from forming those long chains and prevent them from sickling. So they'll continue to stay as a nice bara shape and then it's going to be good for them. And it is the fact that the F globin progressively goes away from childbirth to the point where they uh, are like two years old. Uh, it's not a hard cut off, it, it slowly goes away. Uh, that they start experiencing lots of the symptoms. Now, Physiologically, some of the kids will start extending the expression of the F-globin further out into their uh, childhood, so they have a milder phenotype. So how can we use this knowledge and try and cure the people with sickle cell disease? So what we do is basically take the uh, beta-globin, we package it into a, a, a lentivirus, and then we can take the autologous bone marrow. So take the bone marrow from the same person. So you're not transferring it from another person. So they're not going to have any rejection issue. Now put back this beta globin and put it back into the patient. Uh, when you put it back, obviously there, the patient already has some um, bone marrow stem cells. So if you try to put this back again, then there's not going to be enough space. So you usually give them like a, a small dose of a chemotherapy, basically getting rid of some of the bone marrow stem cells. So you can make some space for the new ones that is being um, altered with the gene therapy to go back inside and fit those pockets. So then they can uh, proliferate and then make more blood cells from that. But the disadvantage with that is a standard beta globin, as I said, even though it can stop, uh, it might not have the uh, affinity for the making the rods, it doesn't basically block it from taking over. So what we did um, as part of our work is that we engineered the, uh, the 3 um, um glycine. So we engineered the anti-cycling uh, feature that we saw in the gamma globin or the F globin and a couple of slides back and put it into the beta globin. So now this one is actively blocking the, um, um, what do you call the sickle mutant from uh, making those chains. The other things that we also did is slightly increase the affinity for this new beta globin for alpha globin. So when the body is actually producing beta globin and alpha globin, when it's making the multimer, the alpha will preferentially pick the, the um, modified beta over the uh, native beta. So then it's going to be having a better uh, benefit for them. The other thing we also did was like, because when, when these do multimers and they start making these rods, we introduced another mutation is these are intentionally engineered mutations that will prevent two of those uh, multimers from coming into contact and making these rods. So it's be actively breaking it up. So even if you have one or two that's forming a, a, a clump, then it breaks it up immediately. And so they can continue to maintain a very good discord shape. 
And so here is a, 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 a image of a sickle mouse. This is a mouse that has been uh, genetically modified so that they develop sickle disease because mice don't basically have sickle disease. Now we have to engineer them to have the sickle disease and then correct them. So when you have the sickle um, um, gene put into them and like their native gene altered to make it sickle, then you can then correct it with the gene therapy. Now, uh, so if we do make these um, gene therapy and put it in the bone marrow, now, do we know that it actually going to make red cells because bone marrow cells will make all sorts of cells. It'll make a, a, a white blood cell, it'll make a, a, a platelet cell for clotting, um, and it also make the red cell. But we need to make sure that the ones that have been modified actually go into the uh, red blood cell uh, what do you call it? lineage so they can actually be functional because if it starts going only to the white blood cell then the, you, you are not going to see any benefit from this so what um, we did was like okay take these blood uh, uh, bone marrow stem cells convert them uh, uh, add the um, uh, gene therapy uh, vector into it and then in vitro so this is not inside the body but outside the body we give them the correct growth factors at the correct time so we can basically guide them into a uh, blood cell uh, lineage and so when we do that then we get a fantastic uh, uh, outcome where we have 87.7 percent of them are actually becoming erythrocytes and they are expressing the gene that we are interested in them expressing okay so so as far as the, the process is concerned, we know that it, the, the molecularly it works, outside the body it works. So now we need to figure out um, if it is the, the product that is coming out is functional. So once we do make the red cells and that we have the beta globin and alpha globin and the modified beta globin sitting in there, that they are making the correct combination and that, that the product that is coming out is also effective. So you can here see here that the HbA3 is the uh, one that's modified and you don't need a lot of it. Like people think, oh, if you want to do a gene therapy, you have to basically change all of the globins. No, you don't need to change all of it because we have thoughtfully engineered to make sure that they can break up this uh, um, structure formation, like rod formation. You just need a little bit. So between uh, what we found was like between uh, 10 to 18 percent, you get fantastic results. You don't have to make it 100 percent. And and so we can see again here that when you have uh, a beta globin uh, engineered beta globin, it's beta AS3. I will I might switch between back and forth because this has the three anti-cycling mutation, and that we can get with 18 um, to 20 percent expression we get fantastic uh, correction of the um, phenotype. So what all do we need to do before we can take it to even preclinical? Because obviously what we do in preclinical is basically an identical of what we would do to a patient, but then doing it in an other, another model like a mouse or uh, um, a rhesus monkey or a pig or some, an, another model to show that whatever we are doing here, if replicated in humans, should be safe. That is the biggest, the safety is the biggest thing that we want to look at. Efficacy too, but safety is one of the biggest things that we want. So we want to make sure that we can optimize the transduction so that we get good amount of vectors going into the uh, um, bone marrow stem cells and that uh, the bone marrow stem cells remain bone marrow because sometimes when you modify it outside then they can uh, decide not to be bone marrow anymore and that the bone marrow stem cells that we have modified can continue to have the full potential of a uh, stem cell bone marrow stem cell and that we get good level of expression of the um, the protein that we are trying to express which is the beta as3 and that if you put it in uh, into the uh, mouse, whether it is a, a normal mouse or a transplant mouse, that you get a good amount of expression and that it's function. Um, we also evaluate that it is morphologically correct because the sickling is not 
um, a biochemical reaction. It is actually a physical reaction that the anatomy of the red cell is being modified and that's where the problem comes from. So we want to make sure that morphologically it is doing correctly. And then the third and the most important is that it doesn't cause any insertion in mutagenesis. What we mean by that? Because we are using a viral vector. This vector basically takes whatever we give it. So in this case, the beta AS3 takes it and sticks it into the genome. But it doesn't stick it into the genome where the normal beta globin was. It just sticks it at random at some place. Now, what happened in the past was that when we put these viral vectors and stick it somewhere, those vectors kind of wanted to go to places where there are growth promoting genes or growth factor genes. And so when it goes into those domains, what happens? There are some minimal viral activity that is present in those what we call as LTRs, long terminal repeats that happens on either ends of the, the package that we are delivering. Those will kind of trigger the growth factor gene to be a little bit more. It's not a lot more, it's just a tad bit more than not what we normally will see. And that accumulates little by little by little and basically pushes the cells to go into a, a hyper proliferative state where the cells are just replicating randomly and becoming a lymphoma. Uh, so this is something that actually happened um, in the past and it happened for a, um, another disease which is basically an immune disease where the kids were immune compromised. And so when they did uh, a gene therapy, they ended up getting a lymphoma. So you start with uh, uh, immune uh, compromise, but you end up with lymphoma. So then it was a big nightmare. So people had to go back and revise the idea of how we want to deliver. So the current one, because uh, I hope you remember, so we, I said this is a lentivirus. Lentivirus is the same virus that is from the HIV virus. Lentiviruses, they can enter the cells no matter what time of or what stage of the cell is. It is. It can go in even if the uh, DNA is fully tightly wound, it will still go inside. It has the capacity to do that. While other uh, vectors, they had to wait for the cell to divide and the DNA to be nice and long and stringy so they could insert. So this is one of the advantages of Lenti. The other thing with Lenti is that it doesn't prefer growth promoting genes. It goes kind of uh, more towards genes than gene uh, devoid area like deserts. It goes towards genes, but it doesn't particularly go towards growth promoting genes. So that's one of the other advantages that we will have with the lentiviral vector. So what are we going to do? Now, because the lentiviral vector is a little safer uh, vector, you basically have to push the system so hard that the bone marrow was replicating, replicating, replicating and really show that no matter how many times the bone marrow cells replicates, that it is not going to cause, uh, it's not going to trigger a lymphoma. Because obviously mice have a much, much shorter life uh, lifespan than humans have. So uh, we want to make sure that that kind of extended testing that we can replicate in the mice. So what we do is we take uh, boy J mice, they have a specific, uh, slightly different uh, bone marrow stem cells because they have a different marker on it. And then you select them, you select them only for the stem cells. You basically get rid of all the other cells and then take the um, vector that we want to insert. That's our um, beta AS3 gene. But then we also have to make sure we have one that is basically empty. The, the vector is there, all the other parts are there, but the gene itself is not there. And the third one is a retroviral vector where the gene is not there, but because it's a retroviral vector, it will actually cause lymphoma. So why do we need it? Because our end point is to make sure that it doesn't cause lymphoma. So we want to make sure that we have a positive control which will cause lymphoma and a negative control that can never cause lymphoma. And then in between is what we have, right? Our gene um, delivery system is going to be in between. So we have three different vectors that we're going to do. And then once we get those vectors onto the bone marrow stem cells, then we will inject them back into another type of mice. These are C57 black 6, which has a different CD45 architecture. So we irradiate them. So 
we make some space for that this new bone marrow to go in and then we inject it into the uh, mice so this new bone marrow stem cells will go and populate their bone marrow and then we'll start producing uh, blood cells now after four months you give them this bone marrow you basically sacrifice these mice and take the bone marrow and split them so for every mouse that we have we will take the bone marrow and split it into two mice so basically if you start with five mice you will have 10 mice in second why why do we do that because in the primary mouse it has already settled in and it is going to make the number of replications the bone marrow is going to make is very few because it needs it once in a while but if you take it out completely devoid another mouse and then put this back again then the bone marrow has to replicate again and then refill the population so it's going to put more stress on the bone marrow so that's what here so you take the second um the bone marrow from the mice that's already transplanted and then inject it into a secondary mice now those mice you keep for six months and then check do a very very detailed analysis looking at the benefits you get from the, the new gene, gene therapy vector and also looking at the toxicity effect that is basically uh, uh, lymphoma so you basically peel them apart every single tissue and analyze them with um, um, facts and you do uh, vector copies and then we do uh, genome analysis to make sure that we have everything covered so how many are we going to do we are going to do uh, 10 males 10 females with the negative mark vector 10 males 10 females with the test which is the beta as3 10 males 10 females from positive uh, um, control which is basically was going to cause the lymphoma okay and in secondary we'll take only five of these guys and split them and make them into 15 or sorry seven of them and then split them into uh, uh, one 15 months and then as i said before like we'll do a very very detailed analysis of every single organ because even though this is a bone marrow specific one because blood travels to every part of the body you have to check the brain eyes and all sorts of places to make sure that it has not gone into some corner and hiding in this little place and then developing into a lymphoma so we want to make sure that everything is completely ruled out so this is the detailed list of everything that you can think of and this uh, i should mention is a requirement from the fda because fda wants to make sure that whatever that goes out to be tested on humans that it is really really safe so this is a requirement from the fda and so we have to comply with this so what did we get so we so this is split into three because we did it in three different cohorts for various technical reasons so each of this will have a test a mark uh, the sffp is the positive control again it's cohort two test mark positive control and this top box is for the primary transplant and the bottom box is for the secondary transplant mm -hmm. so um, we see that there is a good median engraftment between 60 and 90 percent um, the bone marrow was taken up and they actually went in and established itself and made um, um, blood cells and then when we look at how many copies of the vector of the gene went in it's about five three to five copies per um, bone marrow stem cell now very important thing to understand is that because this is more like uh, um, spraying a field you are not actually controlling where things will land you're basically throwing it in at random some bone this is an average some bone marrow stem cells will have just one copy some will have two some will have three but the higher the copy number becomes the higher the risk of getting a lymphoma because they can intermix between themselves because these are all exactly the same copies right so uh, you have a, a, another sequence that's identical then they can they can try and cross over and do stuff like that so we don't we want to keep them at bare minimum so three is about like the safe limit like you you don't want to cross that but three to five for lengthy it's a little bit okay so when we did it for the um, uh, secondary mice again we get a little lower because obviously these have been already replicating and now that they are being forced to re-establish uh, so that you get between like 60 and 70 uh, 80 percent that's where you get and the copy number is also slightly lower between two and uh, uh, 
between one and five and three percent this is also something that we need to look into because when you have multiple copies the body knows that it has multiple vector copies and will actually take get rid of it it's something that we do and so um, we have to be careful so that we don't overdose it because the body will start developing autoimmune to the bone virus cells. so that's something that we want to avoid as well so irrespective of what condition is whatever the test process is we will see lymphoma the reason behind that is because we have irradiated the mice before we gave them the the bone marrow stem cells so they will endogenously develop some lymphoma what we want to be very careful is that the lymphoma was not triggered or was not caused by the vector that we put in okay so yes we have this test vector with beta as3 which has got one lymphoma in the primary and two lymphoma in the secondary mice. Uh, Mark also had lymphoma, which is interesting because uh, they don't have the vector that will cause lymphoma. And thankfully, the, uh, the um, positive control, which didn't show any lymphoma in the primary, did have a lymphoma in the secondary mice. So now, of course, once they start showing lymphoma, then you bring out the full panel of making sure this particular lymphoma, this cells never got the uh, vector, or if they got the vector, that it is not the cause of the lymphoma. So here are the test mice, uh, animal ID ABC. Um, this is uh, number of months post transplant, and you can see the tissue involved. First mouse, it's only the thymus that's in in involved lymphoma it's going there the other ones they have the bone marrow spleen thymus kidney so it's basically called some metastatic lymphoma and it's everywhere in, in the body it's trying to infiltrate and now the third column this is our our good call because this is shows that the stem cell that is actually becoming uh, um, lymphoma is coming from the host it is not it is not the cell that we transplanted and inserted into the uh, mouse so all of our tissues are good because this is coming from the host. Um, this one, when we narrowed it down, it was not a lymphoma, it's just lymphoproliferation without being full-fledged lymphoma. And then they're all host cell derived. So we are uh, kind of relieved that it's not caused by the, uh, the vector. And then in the marks, which is basically the empty vector, Again, you can see it's all host cell derived because they, when they got irradiated, their DNA got damaged and then they actually went into uh, a lymphoma formation. And in the positive control, it's actually donor because this vector where we put it in, it is the cell, the, the vector that's with the viral contract that's driving it to become the lymphoma. Okay. So um, just to summarize, there are six animals that had lymphoma. Um, one of them was uh, lymphoplastic hyperplasia, which basically increased number of cells with that lymphoma. Uh, tests in mock animals only got it from the host cells. And the positive control actually got it from the uh, vector that we put in, which is intended to cause uh, lymphoma. So all of this information, the fact that we did a whole bunch of preliminary work before we even went into the mouse to show that this system works. And then when, it, when we put it into the mouse, we showed that A, it, the system works and that it does not cause any uh, um, lymphoma in the, in the uh, animal. So all of this put together, plus you will have to show how you're manufacturing the product. How are you testing the product? How can you make sure that there is no mistakes that's going to happen and that the entire process every step of it is completely validated and everybody double checks triple checks make sure there's nothing that can go wrong in the manufacturing generation any of these processes and then you submit the whole thing to the fda just for this thing when you actually fill the final ind it's about uh, uh, three feet tall about a meter tall of paperwork and it's several 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 volumes binders with each specific task that we have been working on and that's what goes to the fda before they would even think about considering us for a phase one clinical trial now what is the current status there are currently seven trials in progress um, 
for various uh, stages. Okay? Some of them are still in early stages. Others have gone and become part of industry. So what I mean by industries, all of this work that was done was done, done at the at Cincinnati Children's Hospital, which is a non-profit organization. And is also done with UCLA and University of Cincinnati and other places, which are all non-profit academic institutions. Now, when you want to take it to a commercial success, you need an industrial partner who needs to take this because like big companies like Novartis, Pfizer, and all of these guys, they have the, the resource, the know-how, and the, the, the money to take this forward. So they usually come up and pick these up. So when you see um, names like the Drepa Globe, which is now uh, a drug, right? Like, so it's now become a, uh, uh, they get a fancy name instead of the BAS3. Uh, then they become a product that is being uh, actively used by the, uh, the pharma company, biotech pharma company. Um, and then ARU1801 is another vector that was also that something that I did. And that uses, instead of using the beta AS3, it basically uses just plain old gamma globin. And so, because it already has the capacity to break up the, um, um, the chain, that it actually has good oxygen carrying capacity. And so the plain simple uh, gamma globin is used, and that is also very effective. And then we have one of them. This is one um, slight difference in that that is a CRISPR-based technology. It is still very preliminary. They have not gone into any major scales, but there they want to actually correct the endogenous beta globin so they don't get the sickle disease. Um, so that's one that, that we are keeping close eye on as to how that's going to work out. But the rest of them are being done at different places. It's done in the US, it's done in France. Um, there's one that's starting up in the UK as well. So the thing is, even though this is a, a virus derived, it's an envelope virus derived, just like the coronavirus, when we know exact enough information about the virus and we have the technology and the capacity to change it to benefit humanity, that is where you get the power because it is just like fire. If you take fire, fire can cause burn down a building, but it can also cook food. So it has both uh, features. To it. So if we know the best of it, if we can engineer it well, and we can test it well, then we are always going to get good benefits out of it. And even though none of these trials have actually posted number of patients cured, because I'm in the, in the field and I'm in the, this thing, I know several patients who have been cured and they are completely cured. This is, again, I have to say, this is a cure. This is not like a pill that you take because pill you take, you stop taking the pill, you don't get the benefit. Uh, this is a cure is once you put it in, that is it, you just treat once and you get the benefit throughout lifetime. And the risk with that is once you put it in, you have it throughout the lifetime. So there is no wiggle room for mistake because if you take a drug and the drug doesn't work with you, you can stop taking the drug. 24 to 48 hours later, it's probably going to go away from your body and you, you will not have the bad, the bad effects from it. For this, you put it in, it's in. It's very hard to take it out. So we need to be super duper careful as when we do the uh, testing. So, so the point is like there are lots of patients who have completely cured and they are living perfectly normal life and it's very very satisfying when you go through and meet these people and you see that your work has actually produced uh, excellent change uh, for somebody's lifetime okay so in conclusion sickle cell disease is curable it is not something that you just fix uh, band-aid it you actually can cure it a well-designed safety and efficacy will always pay off. You have to be very, very careful when you design it from the ground up that you are keeping safety and uh, the long-term benefits in your mind when you design it. Uh, right now, this technology is very expensive. It has The cost has come down from the past five, uh, five to seven years. The cost has come down. Uh, insurance does pay for this if you if you have a patient if you have a child who has this um, but it's still very expensive and you can see that the number of places that you that do it is basically only us and france and not very many places
Now, as scientists in India, we know that this problem affects tribal people and people who cannot, have, who do not have a, lot of, have a lot of money for them to pay for this. So it is our responsibility to take these innovative solutions that's available that other people have figured to modify it, to fix it, to do it, to make so that it works for Indian requirements. It's not, it, you cannot just, just take that and stick it here. It won't work. Um, we have to work with our system, work with our people and make sure that it is cost effective and we can get these things done. It's one of the things that we should be proud of with the uh, with our uh, vaccine development. We have an endogenous system where we can make it in India and produce just as good an effect as any of the Western developed ones and that we can manufacture it in quantity and make it available to our people at really, really low prices. So that's something that's very, very important for scientists to keep in mind. And that, that this process is not a one-time fix. We have to keep going at it, keep fixing it, keep making iterative changes to make it better and better and better. Otherwise, it's going to be like one shot and stop. It's not going to work for us. So keep this in mind when you're looking at your PhDs, you're looking at your postdocs, you're looking at your careers, and think of the one thing that you really want to go at. Like this is something I see in my family, this is something I see in my community, this is something I see in, in, in places where I visit my village, I want to work on it, and that's something that is going to drive me for a long time. So that's something that you would want to uh, keep in mind when you pick, because these are not easy stuff. These are really, really difficult, like you work 24 hours straight, 36 hours straight, just to make sure that things go smooth. So um, if you have the passion, it will drive you perfectly. Okay. Uh, of course, this is not one man's work. This is a huge number of people who have to do all of these processes. Now I have to thank my uh, mentor, uh, Dr. L.K. Grossman, uh, Mindy Applegate, Heather, uh, all the technicians who work tirelessly on this to make sure that everything works the way it should work and documentation everything is like perfect because the FDA will will pounce on you the moment they find any documentation mistakes um, and then the viral vector core we, where they actually manufacture these vectors to specifications it's very very important we have uh, our department of pathology uh, Dr. Shivkumar Shanmugappa um, who did an amazing work for making sure that every single organ, everything is fully and completely analyzed to make sure that there is no, no part that's, uh, that the lymphoma can hide. So we've got great, of course, we thank the veterinary services because they, they have to manage all of these mice and they have to make sure that the food is correct. Uh, every, every single minor detail, like the temperature is correct. The water that they drink is perfectly purified and two specifications. Uh, and the cages are cleaned in specific times and there's none of the mice get fever or something. Like that. So we have to check everything. And uh, um, Dr. Don Cohn and Fabrizio Binati, they basically started with the Beta AS3 project and he's, he's the super brain behind it. I basically did the safety and making sure that everything, the efficacy parts are good. And uh, so another PI who's Dr. Poonam Malik, uh, who also did the second vector that I pointed out, um, something like that. So with this, I'll take questions. Uh, thank you so much. I thank Nite and thank Anirvan and Arthi um, and Dr. Bandari for giving me this opportunity. Um, thank you so much. All right, uh, so thank you, Shiv, uh, for this wonderful uh, insight into uh, sickle cell disease and uh, the ways uh, one could think about uh, treating it. So, uh, uh, Shiv, uh, there is a bit of at your end. Pardon me? There's a bit of coming in from your side. Okay, cool. So, okay, I can mute while you're talking. No problem. Yes. So. So uh, there are a couple of questions for you. Um, so one question is, uh, it's a non-technical one, of course, but linked to gene therapy. So the question is, what is the major difference between a somatic gene therapy and the germline gene therapy? Uh, so as of now, and possibly for the near future, it's all going to be uh, somatic. Reason being, 
when we put these vectors into uh, cells. We really don't know how they are going to behave once it starts crossing things over. We really have no control over it. And that we really do know when somebody gets the gene therapy, gene therapy, I mean, participation in it basically precludes them from participating in any other therapy because now it's already in them and that we don't want to risk uh, triggering something in them because they took something else. So when we go germline, it is super difficult to control because the kids might, the newer things might come up. So we basically avoid going to germline. The only places where they have allowed is these mitochondrial mutations and things like that, where there is no way you can, um, I mean, it's basically morally wrong to prevent them from having good, healthy children. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's a very uh, reverse way of looking things, but it, it's one place where they have allowed uh, because mitochondrial DNA, DNA is just fix it, it's not going to go through all sorts of uh, crossover and stuff like that. So there's a little bit of safety built in there and that, that they can proceed with that. It's, it's, that's uh, the only place where I've heard that they have even kind of like allowed. But uh, um, as far as uh, genomic DNA manipulations, no, you don't do it on germline. Do it only on somatic tissue, somatic stem cells. Uh, Shiv, uh, there's one more question. Uh... All right, so uh, you spoke about your uh, experiments over here and uh, you looked at lymphoma, development of lymphoma as a, one of the consequences. So the question is, is lymphoma going to be the only consequence one should be worried about or you could anticipate other kinds of tumor? So um, for this setup, um, because it's a bone marrow stem cell derived setup, um, your biggest risks are coming from um, lymphoma. Though I'm saying lymphoma, it can be lymphoma, myeloma, it can be uh, uh, um, megakaryocytoma, like you can get other types, but invariably you tend to get into either the T cell or B cell lineage where you're going to get into trouble. Um, because the red cells are, uh, don't have a nucleus, we don't have to worry so much about them uh, because these two groups tend to go uh, hyperproliferative. Uh, and they also need the setup for them like, like a B cell when they actually encounter the actual um, what do you call it, target, then they need to convert them into like plasma cell and like make multiple copies of them and then uh, make a lot of, lot of antibodies. They need to retain that hyperproliferative state. And these gene, these uh, viral vectors can kind of like tap into it and then like hijack. It. So that's that's it. for other systems, like say if you're going to use an AAV for like a cardiac gene therapy, or you're going to use it for like uh, eye diseases. Um, these are not so much of a concern because most of these are terminally differentiated cells, or even if you put it in liver cells, they're terminally differentiated. So you don't worry so much as um, proliferative diseases, and they usually tend to have an immune response. That's usually where you get their problem. Uh, so two more questions uh, for you, Shiv. Uh, uh, so in your pre clinical trials that you showed, uh, and you at the end of your uh, presentation you showed the clinical trials, about six of them. Um, so is there any information on the number of people recruited on the clinical trials, or how many animals should be considered to be good enough? For a preclinical trial uh, to be uh, taken up by for a, for a clinical approval, is there any cutoff on the number of animals that you have to use in a preclinical uh, state? So um, right now, um, the numbers from each of those trials has not been released. So that's why I didn't put an official number there, but. From unofficially, we have, uh, at least for beta AS3, we have well over 20 um, uh, patients who have been cured. And one of the interesting things that, that happened is when we originally presented the IND, um, we requested that uh, patients above the age of 13 be allowed to participate. Why 13? In, by US law, 
um, th- uh, children who are 13 years of age, they can provide an assent. They understand what you're trying to do and they can provide assent. Like, okay, my parents are the ones who are going to sign it, but I am providing assent that I am interested in getting this. Um, so, and younger kids were not allowed. So even though they would have developed some of the uh, injuries from, from lack of uh, um, um, gamma globin or F globin, but this is a good age. And they said, we will do it for three patients. And if the, the data still looks good, then we can lower the age. Within six months of the first two patients getting the gene therapy vector, FDA actually specifically called us and said, lower the age. Because even though we had originally said we'll do three, within two patients, they said, lower the age to three years of age. Because the effect that we are seeing is so dramatic that the the number of hospital visits, the, the pain-free days, all of those were so dramatic that they decided like, no, within six months, lower it down, start treating three-year-olds. And now it is a routine practice between, uh, to uh, treat patients that were as young as three years of age. Um, and three years is only because that, that we have sufficient number of bone marrow cell stem cells that we can get and that you don't want to unnecessarily like, uh, take away too much too early so that's the, that's why the three years page um, as far as the number of animals that you need to to what you could say um, prove that, that your system is safe there is no hard first number it depends on the vector it depends on what you are trying to show if it is um, um, say an AAV based system where you are not going to have as many um, proliferative disorders that you're going to see. If you're doing it in the eye, which is basically a closed system, we are not going to have too much of a leakage and stuff like that. You can have much smaller numbers and you can basically treat left eye with the right eye as control and you reduce the numbers as well. So uh, there's no hard fast number, but as long as the output that you're showing can be not just statistically, it's logically significant that you have shown in every which possible way that you are not, you have stressed the system sufficiently to show that there is no proliferative disorder possible and that the um, um, the numbers, the, the statistically you can show that yes, even if I extrapolate these numbers further out that you are not going to see that uh, effect anytime soon. So those would basically convince the FDA to say, okay, this number is fine, go ahead and start your preclinical because you do present it ahead of time in preclinical and show like this is what I'm, my plan is please approve and then you go ahead with the, the preclinical safety um oh uh, yes thank you Shiv. Uh, um, so the last question is um, uh, as we know there are uh, non-viral uh, methods of delivery as well particularly if we talk about induced pluripotent stem cells now people are using non-viral ways of uh, delivery of uh, the the transcription factors. So, uh, can we see something in future in in stem cell, uh, in particularly in gene therapy, in your condition that you are focused on? Are you thinking of any non-viral uh, methods of delivery? Uh, right now, there is not much of uh, interest in non-viral. The reason being, non-viral works great for say muscle cells or well, like Duchenne muscular dystrophy or something like that, where you can deliver RNA, you can deliver it as a plasmid or something, and it can go in and it will stay there and continue to produce because, and the striated muscle will just keep it there because it's not going to uh, disintegrate it anytime soon. For bone marrow stem cells, the requirement that they keep uh, keep up with the pace of the bone marrow stem cells uh, dividing and that the um, vector doesn't get diluted up. Like, so if you if it is not going to integrate into the genome, the first bone marrow stem cell will have 10 copies, the next one will have 5, the third one will have 2.5, so like, you just keep going down and down and down and then at, at one point it will replicate but you won't have any copies in that. So um, because of that reason, we want a vector that actually goes in, sits in, or like the new one that's being tried, go in and correct the endogenous genes so we don't have any viral pieces sitting around. It's just a native uh, uh, gene that's already corrected and that we don't have to do any further correction. So the, the vector pieces don't stay in that. So you deliver uh, the, what you call template and you deliver the protein that is going to do the recombination and that will be the end of the story. So then all the other things is going to get degraded 
the bone marrow is connected. All right, Shiv, thank you very much for answering this question. So yeah, I don't think there are any more uh, questions uh, uh, for you. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for uh, taking us through the gene therapy as a technique and with the example that you gave. And uh, we really hope that, uh, you know, these uh, clinical trials are, uh, you know, truly trans uh, translate into uh, standard uh, treatment practices in, in future. Uh, not only for sickle cell, but also for other kinds of incurable diseases that we are aware of. So um, a customary uh, vote of thanks has to happen before we conclude the session. So uh, I would like to start with thanking you. Uh, if we are to having this in person, I would have thanked you differently. But now I have to thank you over the internet. And uh, uh, I can only uh, express our sincere thanks on behalf of the university, as well as from our consortium. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your wonderful uh, uh, presentation and uh, for uh, uh, explaining the nitty gritty of uh, gene therapy. Of course, uh, for some of the student members here, it could have been a little more, uh, perhaps it was a bit more technical for them, but I'm sure, uh, you know, they would still get an idea on how to uh, think more on these kind of things. And as you rightly pointed out, uh, follow your passion and uh, see to that you know, you are uh, going for it. So I guess that could be a message that they could take home uh, after this, in addition to the knowledge that they gained about gene therapy. I would also like to thank my co-founder, Dr. Arti, who is here with me uh, for facilitating uh, this uh, discussion and this talk. Of course, um, for the benefit of the audience, uh, Dr. Shiv and Dr. Arti were colleagues earlier uh, in, in MedGenome, and uh, that's how they uh, got known to each other. And uh, thank you, Arti, for bringing in uh, Dr. Shiv uh, today uh, for, for, for the uh, webinar series uh, or the seminar series of our consortium. I would also like to thank our Honorable Vice Chancellor, uh, Professor Dr. Satish Kumar Bandari, for being here with us and for his introductory remarks and for uh, the support uh, from the university. Uh, to carry on with the activities of the consortium. I would also like to thank my uh, IT team at the university, Mrs. Savita and uh, Mr. Mahesh, for um, their help in facilitating the, the live streaming of the webinar on YouTube. And finally, all the participants who have registered for this webinar, before we uh, say goodbye, uh, there's a small announcement to you. Uh, those of you interested in having a certificate of this uh, seminar, you need to go to the YouTube description box and the feedback is uploaded there and it is also put up on the chat box. Please fill it up before you log out um, and only those who uh, do this would uh, be eligible for the e-certificate that would be issued by the university. So on that note, uh, thank you once again everyone for being a part of this um, uh, seminar series. Um, so this is a mandate of the consortium to conduct a seminar every two months. So till we meet again, uh, thank you and have a good evening. Thank you very much.